And in those days during the war, I mean, the, the bomb aiming wasn't very accurate. So, you know, lots of bombs fell around us. In 1939, my brother joined the RAF and off went to war. My sister, I think she left about 1940. I think she was called up and was in the Women's Royal Air Force. So the family more or less disintegrated and left me with my mother, just the two of us. Which was a, a problem because my mother worked. She worked as an auxiliary nurse in the local hospital. So she left early in the morning about seven o'clock and didn't come back till about half five. So I had to get myself up and go off to school, even though I was only a nipper, and come home. I suppose you call it a latchkey kid. I think that was the phrase they used to use. It was quite frightening. An interesting time and a traumatic time. those days during the war, I mean, the, the bomb aiming wasn't very accurate. So, you know, lots of bombs fell around us, being so close, really. Because of our situation, we were in direct line coming across from the coast to central London. And sometimes planes would drop their bombs and turn around and go back instead of Travelling on to central London, where there were a lot of aircraft were there, to the Spitfires and Hurricanes, um, or on the way back, if they hadn't got rid of their bombs, they didn't want to go back to Germany, they would drop them around where we were. Uh, I can remember opening the front door, we were on the ground floor of the flat at night, and listening to the shrapnel falling down through the nearby trees. And it was just really the realisation of the chaos that it could cause. That, that, you know, you go down a road you walk to school to or whatever else, and there's two houses missing. And Mrs. So-and-so doesn't live there anymore, you know. It's, it's frightening, really. And even at that age, it starts to hit in, you know. An anti-aircraft gun would come and station itself at the top of a lane just outside our front gate and be firing at the bombers, uh, which meant there was little sleep that night and quite frightening every time it went off because it's only a matter of sort of, you know, 20 yards from the, from the flat. I was nervous because I'd never met, I'd never spoken to these people up the road. But, you know, I was just given a little suitcase and a gas mask and handed over to them and go off with people. We imagine a six-year-old. You don't know them from Adam. The ex whole experience was horrible, really. And there you are in a completely different part of the country. And then with staying with people, other people who you don't know, strangers, no contact with my mother. I mean, I was too young to write letters. I, don't, I can't remember whether she wrote to me or not. I don't think so. No telephones, of course. I mean, we never had a telephone at home. Um, the, the, that was the only communication you could have had, but, but it didn't happen. So I was away from my mother from eight, for 18 months without speaking to her. So yes, it was quite frightening, really. You feel a bit like a lost child. We obviously got to the relations house and the only thing I can remember there was the difficulty in sleeping. Um, it was awful. I was twisting and turning. 
I don't know what they would be called in those days, the sort of social services of their day. Well, they came round and they found that I was covered from head to foot in flea bites. It was a, an unpleasant period, really. And then afterwards I was having all this treatment stuff rubbed into my head, combing my hair. And in the end, I had to do that on my own. And I'd never experienced that at home. You know, whatever else we were, we, we were short of money and things like that. We were always clean. And that was a, that was a horrible episode. She did not like us around the house, so if we were not at school, we had to be out of the house, even in the winter or weekends. And I can remember us going down in winter to the seafront, um, bitterly cold, wind straight off the sea. And we would sit in a, a shelter there, a brick shelter, again built above ground. and. Um, we would sit in there and we'd talk about anything that, about warmth, because we were really freezing. <laughs> hot dinners, hot soups, fires, it, it, anything. And, and, and I can still remember that to this day. It made us feel a bit warm just talking about it, I suppose. She had a few hours uh, pass from the airfield. Uh, asked Mrs. G if she could take me out, and, and we went down to the seafront, uh, sat in the sun there, and, and, and talked and ate a piece of cake, very nice. It must have been late afternoon. We got back to her, Mrs. G. I don't know what time it was. Probably about seven, but that's a guess. And the window above opened up and Mrs. G put her head out and said, what do you want? So my sister said, I brought Michael back. She said, it's too late. She said, well, it's only whatever time it was. She said, it's too late. I can remember saying that. So my sister panicked and said, well, I, I can't stay around. I, I've got to go back to the base. It's too late, was the reply. So she said, um, or can I have his clothes? No, she said, it's too late, come back tomorrow. Shut the window. I mean, what was my sister supposed to do? She had to get back to the camp, and I was certainly frightened. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And then she remembered one of the sergeants he worked with lived off base in Newquay itself with his wife. So in desperation, she went round there, and I think I went in, I slept on a settee there for three or four days before the powers to be could move me again. So then I moved to um, another house uh, about 100 yards away from Mrs G's. I can remember the lady and her husband um, being welcoming. You know, said, yeah, I think they'd probably been told what had happened at the last place. The food was always nice and, and hot and uh, they didn't kick you out like the other one did. Um, uh, yeah, so, so it was comfortable in that respect. And they let us go out and earn a bit of money by picking potatoes and, and so I was quite happy there. complete difference was the lack of sirens. I don't remember a siren going off in Yuki at all in the 18 months or so I was down there. And of course there was a beach and there was the sea. I had never seen the sea. It was exciting, yeah. It 
taught me that war, there are no winners in war. No winners in war. I, I think wars, all wars are dreadful when you look at it. Yeah. But I think human beings, what they are, we will always have them. It's a question of power. And power is everything to some people. Things that happen to you when you are young, particularly the sort of things that happen to me, do play a part in what person you become later on. Yeah. So I've always tried to be fair throughout life and, and think of other people. I don't want it, it sounds boastful, doesn't it? But it has made me like that, yeah.